last week we went through the the dispensational ages that uh, appear to cover a total of 7,000 years, pretty much climaxing in a Sabbath rest where Satan will be bound for that thousand years. And uh, all of this is in keeping with the heptatic structure that is threaded through scripture from Genesis right the way through Revelation. And that's that's a a heptatic structure is just the repetition of sevens uh, all through scripture, in case anybody's not aware of that. We also looked at the fact that each dispensation, so then we we looked at um, the fact that each dispensation then ended with some sort of an event that seemed to alter the dynamics of the um, (coughs) geology of the earth or something that some major event on the earth that uh, of separation and it started with the fall which i believe uh, separated the dimensions of the universe and closed off some of the dimensions that adam originally had access to the flood <clears throat> which in all probability separated the continents but we do know that there was massive changes on the earth to do with that Babel, which is a separating of the language, and I believe there's much more on that as well. Some people believe that's the stage that the continents were separated, but I believe that the separation that is talking about is primarily the languages. When it came to Abraham, that was the separating of the nations on earth and the law. One of the questions I've always had about the law is what actually happened when Moses smashed the stones of the law? Because these were handwritten ordinances of God. And I'm pretty sure there was a shaking whenever Moses would have smashed those. Um, But that's just thoughts that I have in my head. And then obviously the cross was the tearing of the veil from heaven to earth. So we can see something dramatic. And then we went on to look at uh, what may be the next um, climactic event of that then we looked at every aspect of jesus suffering on earth and how it mirrored the original downward spiral of adam and each place where jesus shed his blood redeemed back what adam lost or forfeited so that was very illuminating (laughs) if you haven't done it before and even if you have done it before it's good revision So tonight we're moving into chapter nine and we may cover chapter nine and 10. We'll see. (laughs) That That may sound optimistic. Genesis 9, 1, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So God's plan hasn't changed from Adam here. That was his instruction to Adam. And this is the instruction to Noah. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and every upon every file of the air, upon all that moveth on the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. That is basically a carbon copy of the instruction that was uh, given to Adam to have dominion, to multiply and have dominion, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth and then have dominion. There's a change here because um, God has introduced a dietary change of meat, and <clears throat> this is now included. Why? Why did he change the dietary? It's not a law, but it's a custom. The flood would have damaged the growing of the vegetation and the sustenance and the minerals that were normally present in the vegetation before the flood need time to redevelop again. So maybe that's why he gave uh, meat, because meat is iron, which is nourishment for the blood. Hmm. Interesting. You know, that's actually a proven fact. It's actually been proven. One of the things that happened was <laughs> uh, in the tombs, you know, and the likes of pharaohs and the ancient king. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Whenever they died, they used to put sacks of seeds into the tombs. Uh, and this was to, to feed them during their journey. Uh-huh. to the afterlife and these were discovered thousands of years after the event when they um <clears throat> reproduced these seeds they discovered that the the seeds grew but when they grew they discovered that there was nutrients and amino acids and such that are no longer found in the soil or in seeds today wow 
So um, this was actually an experiment carried out and they discovered that uh, there, there were things that were missing. So verse four says, the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, you shall not eat. Not eat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when we jump forward to the Council of Jerusalem, this instruction was given to the Gentiles in the early church from Acts 15, verse 28. For it seemed good, and this is interesting, it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from meats offered to idols, from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, from which if you keep yourselves, you shall do well. Fare you well. So what do we do with this as New Testament believers? This is the book of Acts. This is to the Gentile believers. This is after the cross. And here is an instruction that states in it, not just that the council have decided it, but that it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. Again, it seems good Diane. to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Mm -hmm. That you abstain from meats offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from fornication. So we'll go through them. Abstain from meats offered to idols. In that day, the pagan feasts were common, and they made offerings and sacrifices to pagan gods. And in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul talks about uh, this activity and the eating of food whenever you're in a Gentile home. And he speaks about this and he says that it may have been offered to idols, that you're not to ask, you're simply to eat what's put before you and you're not to ask about its source. And then uh, it also says, though, you can go ahead and eat it if you don't know anything about it. However, if you've been made aware that it has been offered to idols, you can't eat it. Then you can't eat it. So if you've been made aware of that fact, it appears that there's a, have accountability the attached to being informed, but it appears mm -hmm. there's a level of grace offered to cover acts of ignorance. Yeah, mm -hmm. because you don't you don't know that you're offending. Yeah, I think that there's a message in the whole thing as well. We do we are accountable for what we do if we have mm -hmm. knowledge about it. Mm -hmm. I think there is a grace. However, we also know that sin is sin. And whether you know about it or not, it's still sin that still has consequences. God still offers us his grace. But I think it's interesting that there is an accountability once you've been made aware of something. Because then you have to make a decision. And your decision is based on knowledge of the facts. So from things, from blood and things strangled, the Gentiles then would have understood this provision, pro, uh, prohibition to have included drinking the blood of a slain animal or eating the meat of an animal whose blood was not drained out. There has been an argument that one should not eat a rare or medium rare steak because it has blood in it. However, this is talking about the actual blood and the blood being drained out and not about the, the fact that the, the blood does permeate through every part of the body. So there's um, a general consensus that that is simply, it's a reference to only actually eating or drinking of the blood, more associated with rituals. Um, but what about something like blood transfusions? You see, actually... I don't know about the blood transfusions. I know, I, I know sometimes in a car accident, it's essential for life, but that's adding to, I think a complete blood transfusion is where you have been drained of all your body's blood and somebody else's blood put into your body. That's actually very difficult to reach that stage because I think- Yeah, generally... that really happened to Peter. Yeah. Nearly, but not quite. He was down to a pint and a half. Good. Mm -hmm. um, which, what's that, Ken? People with bad kidneys have to have their blood transfused. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Actually, Ken, you're right. They mm -hmm. do have to have blood transfusions regularly. Mm -hmm. And the Jehovah's Witnesses refuse to entertain uh, that, even, even if mm -hmm. their child's going to die as a result. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 
But scripture sp specifies eating or drinking and does not mention the mingling in the form of transfusion. So I did give this some consideration. Yeah. When, when a transfusion is given in the natural, careful consideration must be given to the type and compatibility factor. And so it's quite important because it's dangerous to put the wrong blood, wrong blood type. And it can be life threatening to mix incompatible types. So there's there's a lot of uh, things in here because the life is in the blood. And I think that it's really relating more. There are implications and obviously it's not ideal. A blood transfusion is not ideal. Whether you're a Christian or whether you're not, it's not ideal. But sometimes it's necessary. And if a person's not a believer before that, it keeps them alive. <coughs> it gives them that opportunity, which is also Bible. essential. Diane, do you know that there are 11 different types of blood? 11. I didn't know. They're, uh, the common, there are common eight and there are three very rare types. And the rarest is called golden blood. All right. Wow. So I don't know what significance that had, but I, I did say last week I'd look it up and, and find out 11 different types. Right. That would be very interesting, actually. Golden blood. Hmm. And golden blood is the rarest. And they, that's why they called it golden blood. Right. I must have a wee look at that because that sounds quite interesting. Okay. It really does. And if you get any information on, send it to me, Carmel, because I would be interested. Okay, I will. I will. <clears throat> so the if we consider that as being something, people have views on it, and that's why I threw it in there. But I think that primarily this is talking about satanic occult rituals one of the things that they did do in that day was they offered up their uh children, babies babies children yeah. and their babies to the god still do. Still, do. still do still do to molek i know that the witchcraft circles still offer up babies baby sacrifices mm. and children and yeah, they, the witches would have sex with a new recruit say into their coven Mm -hmm. Yeah. If there's a baby, there's a baby born, born of that consummation, the baby is then offered up as a sacrifice to Satan. Oh, wild. People would then say, but that's murder, which it is. But there's no record of that child anywhere because the child is never registered. That's right. But do, 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 it's not do, on the baby. Mm -hmm. But if you, if, you, if you just go on to the next line in uh, Genesis, uh, um, hang on, I get it again. It says, if anyone takes human life, he will be punished. I will punish with death the, the, any animal that takes human life as well. Mm -hmm. Man was made like God, so whoever murders a man will himself be killed by his fellow man. And that's God's word. Yeah, I mean, one of his laws is live by the sword and die by the sword. Yeah, he said that to Peter as well, didn't he? The Satanists just don't care. No, mm -hmm. they don't. Um, in fact, they are completely submitted to their their yeah. God, which is Satan. Satan. Mm -hmm. So, satanic uh, occult rituals very, very often involve drinking blood. It's very common. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's uh the the sacrifice of the babies which is also linked to bizarre deviant sexual abuse rituals as well mm. that's mm -hmm. all in there too and then we come to john 6 verse 53 and jesus then declares i mean we leviticus uh, right the way through right from genesis but leviticus has so much to say about it it says don't drink the blood don't eat the blood don't touch the blood drain the blood over yeah. and over and over and then john sick jesus says then he declares that unless you drink my blood and eat my flesh you will have no part in me mm -hmm. and I everybody know. walked away and he said to his yeah. own disciples are you going with them i mean it was you know even though he goes on in verse 55 and says my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink he, he makes this random statement without qualifying it John 6, 53, and this is Jesus making this declaration about 
eating and drinking. He knows the Torah. He knows what it says. And yet he makes this statement without really qualifying it. He didn't qualify it to the disciples neither. When he asked them, did they want to go as well? They just said, where are we going to go? We've got Mm -hmm. nowhere to go. I mean, basically what they were saying was, do you remember the day you came to the, the shore and you said, leave your boats and follow me. Follow me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, we'll have no boats now. We'll have no fishing career with nothing. <laughs> We've left so where are we going? <laughs> you know, he says, they're all right. They only came to listen to you. They're going back to work. <laughs> <laughs> you. I have read this a whole lot of times and I just have this picture of this scene in my head about this. But I believe that this scripture is talking about partaking of him as the ultimate source of life. I believe it was a quantum physics statement. And unless we entangle with every fiber of who he is, we will not experience any part of him. We call it communion, which is coming into union with him. The term, if you want a theological term, would be perichoresis, which is probably uh, the root of where Catholicism gets the, the literal... They've sort of twisted it to make it the the literal uh, transubstantiation of the elements into the actual body and blood, Mm -hmm. whereas it's entangling with his his character, with his attributes that brings us into union. It's that partaking of who he is, the very essence of who he is, to become it, to, to become what he is. The... Last one was fornication. So this involves, there's numerous warnings in the New Testament. It's just, I mean, so littered with warnings that this practice can lead to disease. It can lead to unwanted pregnancies, tormented souls, soul ties. um, And it ultimately affects any new relationship you have. When you step up... From one relationship, one physical relationship into another, it affects the relationship that you're in. Mm -hmm. Because you bring things into that relationship that are unhealthy. Yeah. Marriage, the marriage covenant was sealed, is intended to be sealed on on the wedding night. After the Mm -hmm. vows pertaining to that covenant have been spoken forth before witnesses. That's the the process of a a marriage covenant. You go before someone make the vows and you've made these vows and you've exchanged a token, a public token to represent it, which is the ring. And then you go away and you have the private consummation of that. And in the Jewish circles, the the wedding night bedsheets were given to the... Um, the parents of the bride to keep as a token of evidence to prove her virginity. Her virginity. It's actually quite interesting because it is a proven fact as well that um, there is an alteration of the female DNA <laughs> on the exchange of body fluids oh. during mm-hmm. that act. That that actually alters the DNA. One of the things that they used to talk about was how an older couple who'd been married for 30, 40, 50, 60 years looked like each other. And got on like each other. And got on, yep. They grew to be uh, alike in in image and in how in their behaviour, their mm-hmm. traits. And their opinions. Yes, and they could finish each other's sentence. All the different things. Exactly. Mm-hmm. They knew <laughs> yeah. because of this process whereby uh, through that intimate connection there was an exchange of DNA which would take us back one step to what we were talking about uh, with Jesus. I want to say something. Go on ahead. No, uh, I was uh, glad to see, hear you say you know about the covenant and the tokens and the, you know the, the ceremony because sometimes mm-hmm. sometimes Christians um, you know, say, well, sure, it is the sexual intercourse that is the marriage itself, that mm. can, which is true, but it's not done before God and before uh, people. It's not a covenant. It's know? not a covenant and it's not witnessed. It's 
it's sort mm. of like an excuse. Well, at least, you know, that's what it means anyway, you know. Yes. Is that. Mm. So I was interested in hearing you say that. Good, yeah. Say that again. What what happened? You no, know, you had to, you had a token and you did it. Well, a the, God. yeah, you're coming before God and you're taking your vows, so you're verbalizing your plans, yeah. the covenant yeah. yourself, and so the spoken yeah. word is the 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 co the covenant that you're making. Then there's an exchange yeah. of a token, which is the ring, and yeah. or rings, and then. There is the consummation of the covenant, which is a ratification of the covenant by uh, blood. Yeah, and was it was uh, presumed that, uh, and very important that the bride bride was a virgin. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, it was very important, and all of that has been under attack from the enemy right the way down to part of your covenant is. Uh, if you think about it, you are taking on the name of your husband, right? Why do you take on the name of your husband and he doesn't take on the name of you? And I think it lies in what we were talking about. Yours is the DNA that's going to be changed through that union. And so you are the one that is to assume the identity of the bridegroom. So it's another type and shadow. You're to assume the identity of the bridegroom. Mm -hmm. oh. No, he doesn't come and assume the identity of the bride. The bride assumes mm. the identity of the bridegroom. Mm -hmm. it, there's so much in all wow. of this. It's unbelievable, isn't it? If you go even to the more sordid side, I mean, we're talking about areas of infidelity or premarital sex or whatever there. But if you look at fornication from a sordid uh, side, at sordid side, it can lead to depraved and deviant behavior that becomes can become a compulsion and can mm -hmm. open a door to uh, demonic activity and even lead to criminal activities once you mm -hmm. entertain deviant thoughts you've entered you've allowed an open door and demons can enter and that's why that's why we have a sex offenders register because even the courts recognize that these people cannot change they do not wow. have the power to change. And the I reason never... they have no power is because they are sold under sin and they're under the influence of the demonic realm. And it's a, it goes through the process of our thinking in accordance with Dr. Caroline Leaf. We would have used that example even way back down in, in Uri. And the hallmark of this is the continued engagement in such activities despite the negative consequences. Think of a pedophile. There's nothing can stop him. He is totally addicted to this behavior. He's just in bondage to it. So deviant or depraved behavior is considered to be anything outside of the conventional range of sexual behavior, especially that which is likely to cause distress or injury. <clears throat> but is not limited to extreme levels of unhealthy sexual activities. Now that is a, a snippet of the um the medical the dsm the book the book that that records uh categories that they would consider to be have medical implications if you like um so in conclusion to that we can see that some of this is common sense and pretty much all of it is destructive in general um the controversial eating of or drinking blood I believe this relates to the entangling of our soul with his to be conformed to his image. Image, yeah. So and I... the giving up of self for the purpose of redemption by the blood. I believe that if we give up aspects of ourselves that we are not comfortable with, if we see a trait that we don't like in ourselves, uh -huh. um, such as if you consider stubbornness, um, I believe if we lay that on the altar before God, that he will redeem it and give it back to you in the form of godly determination. Amen, Diane. What I agree. he gives you back for what you've given him is the perfected version of what it should have been in the first place. So that's my view on it anyway. So we're on to verse five. We're doing well, aren't we? 
So then verse five, I think that's what you read. And surely your blood, the blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast will I require it. And the hand of a man at the hand of every brother will I require their life. Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed for in the image of God made a man. You read that, Carmel? Yeah. That is a premeditation. It's a premeditated yes, it murder. Yeah. Not manslaughter because manslaughter, there was a provision by God for manslaughter. And that was the cities of refuge. I don't know what's cities of refuge. Uh, okay, well, there's yeah, there's six cities of refuge that were ordained, and it was for people to find refuge in if they had accidentally killed someone, basically manslaughter, that it was unintentional and not done with malice. And they had to stay in that city until uh, the time that the high priest died when they would be released which is a type of um, the cross of Jesus that you go into the city of refuge until the time of the high priest's death and then you're free. Wow. So I'm, I wasn't planning to mention that at all, really. Uh, so I'm, I think it's covered in numbers, if I remember right. The cities of refuge where the appointed uh, cities have been been given. Even things that we say you've, with gloss over sometimes but we'll move on because uh because we'll never get through genesis if we move into everything every part of it uh verse seven and you be ye fruitful and multiply bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein and god spake unto noah and to his sons with him saying and i behold i establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, of every beast on the earth with you, for all that goes out of the ark to every beast of the earth, and I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, uh, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. So this is a promise from God. One of the points here, which I haven't put in, is one of the arguments from some scholars is that these were this was a localized flood, but it couldn't be a, a localized flood apart from anything else. If that was the case, why waste 120 years building a, a boat? Why didn't he just why didn't Noah just take his family and move to another country? Exactly. And if it was localized, why did he end up on the top of a mountain? Because that's a lot of water. There's a, a lot of arguments to refute it. I can't remember all of them now because it's just reading it there. I was just thinking about it. The other point and the most valid is that if it was only local, God hasn't kept his promise because there have been localized floods. What he mm -hmm. says is, I will never again destroy the earth with a flood. And so God states here that it is the earth. That's just in case you happen to come across a uh, some of them that argue for a, a localized flood. Verse 12, and God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that it may I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. So God announces here that a rainbow is the token of his covenant. That's quite interesting. Verse 13 says, I do set my bow. God has claimed ownership of the rainbow. Because he created it, didn't he? Yes, but he, but he used it as a, a sign of a covenant. Covenant, yeah. So a covenant's very, very important to him. Mm -hmm. Who's the counterfeiter? Satan. Satan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The horseman in Revelation, whenever you come to Revelation, there's the white horse and he carries... Not a sword, but a bow. Now, the white horseman, I know some people have promoted that that's Jesus Christ. It, it isn't. It's. I don't think it is. No. It isn't. It's the Antichrist. But um, without going into Revelation uh, to evidence that, if you think it's Jesus Christ, 
you can just do some research and you'll discover that it isn't. So it's a token of a covenant. So here we have during this time that this, uh, the horseman on the white horse comes out carrying a covenant sign. A bow, yes. Like, isn't that? One of the things that in scripture, the Antichrist uh, has been associated by many with Nimrod. We will cover some of that in two chapters time. Next week, probably. We should get the Nimrod next week. If we get through this tonight, we'll get the Nimrod next week. But the end times will see the enforcing of a covenant. That's what uh, people say that the, the Antichrist will sign a treaty for seven years. That's actually no. not in scripture. It says he will enforce a covenant. Covenant, yes. And that it will be shortened to seven years by God. That it will be cut off. That he will enforce a covenant that will be shortened anyway. But we're not in end time, so that's just a wee bit of by the wayside. But it's interesting that this bow that has been given as a covenant from God has been used and distorted. Verse 18, the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth and Ham and the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah and of them was the whole earth overspread. That's a simple statement that every one of us on earth comes from one of those three sons down that line. And since they all came from Noah, we all come from the same source. Shem is primarily seen as uh, being motivated by spiritual matters, that he was yep. the, the worshipper. And yep. this is the lineage of Jesus Christ. He comes through the Shem line. Uh, the, there has been an argument that has been proposed by uh, certain groups of Christians who have said that this is the pure line of Seth, that it was a sinless line. Um, it doesn't really hold. There's a lot of a lot of evidence against, not least of which is the the fact that all men are sinners and nobody can be. Noah was seen to be pure in his uh, genetics. Uh, other than that, he was still a sinner. Ham was known for his physical skills or his you know his talents, his physical talents. Ham is cited here as being the father of Canaan. Canaan, the name Canaan means to bow down. And the other son, Japheth, was known for his intellectual aptitude. And it was um, increase or enlargement and was the meaning of that. I give you those because they do come into play a wee bit later. This, The scripture that speaks of this in, um, I think it's in verse 25, uh, when we come to it. I've put it in here because it doesn't fit in the next the sort of discussion part. When the Bible was translated from Latin into German and to English in the King James Version, the 1611 version, mm -hmm. uh, it determined that the descendants of Ham or the descendants of Canaan were dark skinned and yeah. should, as a result, be servants. Uh -huh. And that was the, the that birthed the slavery of putting the blacks into slavery of slavery. white mm -hmm. people. But he, he, he there was also a, sla a slave to his brothers, yeah. Yes, but it was a distortion. I think it was a deliberate distortion in translation. Okay. To produce, I mean, we were a colonial country anyway, and I believe that I believe it was a distortion of the facts to suit. Depraved man, basically. And here's the question, though. If this was one family, how on earth would one child... I mean, there was only eight uh, people saved. Mm -hmm. How on earth was one of them going to be a different colour from the rest? In the, it has been proven anyway that it's merely a pigmentation of the skin and a lot of it is determined through the generations according to the... Um, climate. climate. Mm. We all bleed red blood. No yes. <clears throat> but it, it was viewed anyway that although the, there was intermingling, there was <clears throat> essentially three races of pre people come down the line. There was Asian, what we'd call Caucasian, and African. But again, this is not corroborated by anthropology or by human genetics. Racism is 
totally satanic at every level. There is no, you cannot get away from it. And if you have any interpretations or translations in scripture that says anything different, then it has come out of man and not from the source of the mouth of God. And I think God proves this every now and again, whenever he produces um, fraternal twins, when there's one black and one white. And I remember it being on the front page of a newspaper when I was about, uh, I don't know, maybe 12 or 13. And it was the picture of uh, twins. And I can still remember the picture to this day because it was on the front page of the the paper. And the babies were probably nine or 10 months old by this stage. But one was a little black Afro child baby. And the other one was as white as almost albino, it was pure white mm-hmm. uh, and really light blonde hair, perfectly straight, light blonde hair, as opposite as you could possibly get. And they were natural fraternal twins, the product of two parents, that were the same two parents. And Stop. there is there are cases of this in... Um, it was, the I think, the National Geographic covered it and i think they had i i think they had gone through a series the the odds of it happening like that because generally there's a mixture and you would have uh like an olive skinned child whenever you have uh, a child the product of a white and a black parent um but they're and it's somewhere in the region of like a million to one or something against would it go back previous generations i wonder I think uh, I think in that case, the one that um, happened when I, I was about 12 or 13, uh, that one, I think, was simply one, I think the mother was white and the father was black, mm-hmm. but it can be a throwback in the generations, and it, it can, uh, it simply can come, come back through just a, as you say, Ken, just a throwback. Mm-hmm. I'd come, come, you know, there can be just some sort of a surge that comes back into play. I don't know yeah. why that it would, but the creator of life knows the reason for it. It would be in the DNA, maybe. Yeah, yeah, but I, yeah, uh, but I, I do believe that God actually presents it that way to prove His mm-hmm. point, and the point is that He doesn't tolerate racism at any level. But we all originate from this one lineage. And there cannot be a distinction in colour. It's just pigmentation. That's mm-hmm. all the difference is. So verse 20, And Noah began to be a husband, <coughs> and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunken. And he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, <coughs> saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. Okay, so this is the first mention of drunkenness. The first mention is always important because it it creates the thread that will run through scripture. But here's the question. Noah himself was already 500 years old when he started building the ark, I believe. And there's no mention before that. Did no one get drunk before the flood? Or let's consider another factor. Because there's been this massive argument about alcohol with Christians throughout the ages. Some say it's okay to drink, some say it's not. Some say it's okay to have one, some say it's it's okay to do whatever you like and have as many as you like. And they will use the argument God created and Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine. I don't know how many times I've heard that from people who will argue for the case of drinking alcohol. Mm-hmm. Then the other argument is that God would not create, uh, would not condone something that was so harmful in people's lives. So I've heard hundreds of times I've heard the arguments. But let's consider another factor here. The aging process was dramatically changed after the flood. Was there some other geological change to the fermentation of the grapes after the removal of the canopy over the earth that altered the toxicity of alcohol? Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, we've just seen that the seeds that were used had shown that there was a different dynamics, which was... Revealed all sorts of changes. Mm -hmm. So was there a change here? And that would invalidate both sides of the argument because there is also an argument that people have used that that there wasn't any alcohol content in the the Book of Acts and things. But 
this would be a completely different argument altogether, wouldn't it? Yeah. And it would also say that even if God did create alcohol, or, well, we know he created the grapes. We know he created that. But what, what he created or called wine, was it different in the original antediluvian um, or pre-flood form? Yes. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, Noah would never... God chose Noah, rescued him, yeah, and instructed him how to build an ark. And the wine that Noah would have partaken of before living in the ark would have been different. The flood came, the alteration of the soil and everything else mm -hmm. because of the flood. That's why Noah became drunk and it was so shocking for his sons that he, that he called his other sons as well. And Noah would never have walked about naked. No, I, I, honest, I, I do think there was something different after the flood. It's certainly worth thinking about, isn't it? It is, absolutely. Because Noah's drunkenness was never mentioned again, only once. But it has <clears throat> such profound effects. And it brought about a curse. Yep. Again, it's like the apple, eating the apple, uh, taking too much of this wine. Oh, Lord, give us wisdom. Mm -hmm. So the drunkenness is, is the first recorded sin of Noah after the flood, who had served God faithfully for literally centuries. But surely there's a warning in here. Anyone who's ever lived with a drinker will totally relate to the warnings here. Noah had just been made the new caretaker of the earth, and he had, that comes along with responsibilities. Remember, Adam was made it, and now Noah was made it. We yeah. read it. The command to multiply and basically subdue the earth. But here we see that in this act of drunkenness, yeah. it destroyed Noah's witness. It ripped his family apart. Mm -hmm. It brought shame upon the family. And it caused such severe embarrassment that it required a family cover-up. Uh -huh. And it removes the shield of protection that is righteousness. It removes the shield of righteousness, that protection mm -hmm. that's, that's over because he's now exposed. It re I mean, you think about that. Anybody who knows a family that has had a drinker in it or has been lived in a family, every single one of those applies. It hasn't changed today. Drunkenness, mm -hmm. nothing good ever comes from drunkenness. It exposes mm -hmm. a person's carnality and it results in nasty, unpleasant and seedy outcomes. We know that in scripture that there are a few cases where wine is used in the positive sense. And even with Timothy, um, a little wine being good for thy stomach's sake. Yeah. And a lot of that is to do with the bacteria and things because there's there's properties that are, are helpful, cleansing properties that are in wine and things. We are always instructed against drunkenness in scripture. The but destructive... No. What's that, Ken? But not against drinking as such. No, no we're not only instructed says, against drunkenness. We are instructed not to against indulge. Yes. Um, the difficulty is that uh, there doesn't seem to be a happy medium too often. The warnings are always against the destructive properties of partaking in it in excess. <clears throat> we know that it destroys health finances, reputation, homes, and marriages. The word alcohol itself comes from uh, an Arabic word, al alhul, which means a body-eating spirit. Wow. <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> and in English, it is the root for ghoul. In the Middle, Middle Eastern folklore, a ghoul was an evil demon who ate human bodies or was said to have been eat, eaten human bodies. In alchemy, alcohol is used to extract the soul essence of an entity. Soul as in S-O-U-L, not. So mm -hmm. this is, the alcohol was used to extract the soul, the, what they would say would be the essence of the soul, causing the body to open up and become more susceptible to other entities. You think about this, 
our court system recognizes a person is not in their right mind when they are under the influence of alcohol. And it is officially used as a mitigating factor for a person acting out of character in a courtroom. That's right. There is a defense called intoxication. Yes. And it will reduce a sentence by years. People will have murder cases downgraded to manslaughter for that. As a Christian, when we consider we should never be not in our right mind. But the term under the influence of alcohol, think about that. You're not in control. You're under the influence of a demonic source that is seeking to eat your body, body eating spirit. Actually, you know, when you look at it, it's really unbelievable. Alcohol is known to suppress the nervous system, kill brain cells. It is responsible for weight gain abnormalities in unborn babies among other things is toxic to the liver uh, there's i got some st uh, statistics um they're 2020 stats in london um by uh, david nutt i don't know uh the ins and outs of it all i just looked at the stats but it's 2020 stats and it says that alcohol related disease is the number one cause of death in the UK of men between the age of 16 and 64. Number one death. Number one cause of death. And women are trailing by just a few years, three or four years behind it. They're catching up. They have jumped on the same bandwagon. And they believe that that is because they have now got more access to the family funds or, or through uh, earning and getting better jobs and Therefore, they can now afford it to the same degree. Beforehand, it was the men only because the women didn't have any uh, independent finances. Yeah. Drinking two bottles of wine per day will reduce a life expectancy of a man by uh, 21 years. The divorce statistics show that one in six divorces cite alcohol abuse as the primary reason. Yeah. 2020 saw this soar to one in four, making it the number one cause of divorce. Now, it's quite interesting because I have never heard of a single divorce uh, being the result of a person not drinking. So for all the drinkers that fight for the right to drink, because it says it in the Bible, it weakens their case substantially. The, the Bible does not indicate to me that... Uh, having a drink, a glass of wine with a meal is not Wrong. okay. But these well, stats show the reason why we are warned against drunkenness. I mean, there there isn't anything good comes out of it. You know, in addition to all those things, the whole family is stony broke because of it. That brings us to the fact that um, being out of his tree and not in his right mind, not knowing what was going on around him, he was lying buck naked in the tent. <laughs> so we can, we, you think about it. You think about whenever you watch somebody who's drunk and they're totally embarrassed afterwards. Yeah. You know, they can't walk right. They're falling. They're, they're slurring their words. They can't string two sentences Word. together. Yeah. The sentences yeah. they do string together are nonsense and they think they're actually logical, you know. <laughs> But they're also very, some. They're also very destructive and verbally abusive. Yes, and in this country, they can be very underhand and sarcastic and things as well. You know, at the very uh, least. But there, it also incites a lot of violence. It is such a destroyer, drunkenness. Mm -hmm. It's a destroyer of every type of human relationship. Yes, it is absolutely, and. It's no wonder God warns us, be not drunk on wine. Yeah. Although it sparkles in a cup, mm -hmm. be not drunk on wine. Well, every sin comes wrapped in gift wrap. Doesn't nice it? Bow on it? Yeah. And, you know, the unfortunate thing is that it has lost its place so that for, for the most part in many homes, it has been so abused that, that the people in the home can no longer enjoy just a simple glass of wine with a meal because they know that it's yeah. going to be abused. I believe that Satan takes everything that God was using and perverts it. 
Yeah, I think so too. And I believe this has been used as one of the communion elements, right? Wine and the bread and the wine, yeah. right? We know that. I believe that he has used the twisting of scriptures to bring uh, so many Christians into a place of abuse of alcohol. In the world, there's an abuse of, there is an abuse of alcohol, but there's more of an abuse of food, which would be the abuse of the bread mm -hmm. element of communion. Mm -hmm. And in Christendom, I have discovered that there's so many have entered into an abuse of alcohol. And I think that it is Satan kicking the teeth to God. Even your own people can't control themselves. So I do, and but that's a personal view that I have um, in studying all of this out. But the bottom line is, it is destructive. We have a better way than to actually bow down under the influence of alcohol. Diane, I think we actually have really fundamentally misunderstood what the purpose of alcohol is in our fallen world. And people, I think people don't realize that there are limited circumstances for its use and it is supposed to be 100% of the time used with food. And that is because alcohol has certain enzymes. If, you're, if you want to partake in it, you should yep. only partake in it with a meal. And that is because it does have certain digestive enzymes on it. And you should not be, you know, a glass. I, I personally don't see anything wrong with a glass of wine with a meal. Alcohol is supposed to naturally go with a meal. And we, I do, not just our, you know, if you look at the, there's many different cultures who actually understand this, like the French, for example. That's right. Very rare. You would never, ever in a million years see a French person drink for the sake of drinking it has to be you know it is only socially acceptable if you do it with food and we have got out of that we seem to think it is socially acceptable to do it whenever with no food in an environment that literally just you know the only thing is there to celebrate drunkenness that's right that's yeah I totally agree with you 100 percent Mallory at um the subject slightly yep Getting back to verse 23, and Sham and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father, and their mm -hmm. faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. Mm -hmm. Then in the verse 24, and Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. In the commentary, it says there are some scholars who believe that either Ham or Canaan, and more likely Canaan, committed an act of homosexuality upon the patriarch. While there is no concrete proof of, of such, there is definitely some indication in that direction. And that's where the curse came about. Uh, yes, we, that is actually the next verse. Um, yep, mm -hmm. we are, we're just <laughs> going to look at that. Um, so we are, we're coming on to that next. But I, I think the, the point that you made, Mallory, is such a valid point uh, in today's society that that we need to get back to brass tacks. Yes. And we need to get back to where uh, a glass of wine is appropriate with a meal. Bull, food, yeah. With food. And that is, it, it has got the enzymes and the particularly red wine in there. The, there are properties within it, but when it's abused, that's whenever the problems come in. And I think what you'll find is that people who do drink are very distant from the Holy Spirit because mm -hmm. they're, they have chosen a different route for to deal with their issues. They are partaking and, of the wrong spirit. Yep, and they're entering into um, carnal strategies. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really like calling them coping strategies because they're not coping. It's not a coping strategy. It's burying no. your head in the sand, and it's it's definitely not because the the problem still remains, and it's definitely not dealing with the root. But I think that I think the best way to teach in Christian circles is to teach the way Mallory just said. Go back to what the purpose of something, because if you don't understand the purpose mm. of a thing, you will abuse it or misuse it. At least with the Holy Spirit, you don't end up, you don't wake up with a hangover. 
You don't wake up with a hangover. You don't lose your family. It doesn't cost you a penny. So your family aren't broke. You're not likely to lose your home or your driving license. So there's so many things and you keep your health because your your soul is in the right place and it's aligned with your spirit. So on to that verse, saw his nakedness. You've touched on that there now, Ken. Um, and it seems to be a lot more sinister than a son seeing his father naked. Yeah, I, I, I mean that, that doesn't even make any real sense, does it? That no. that, that, that would why be curse? Why curse your grandchild? Exactly. Um, the, the rabbinical sources have they they nearly all agree that there was some form of sexual impropriety. Yeah, because his young, what, what his youngest son had done to him. Yes. Yeah. In, in it was an act. Bible, yeah. In my Bible, Diane, it says that Ham gazed with satisfaction. Oh, right. That's an interesting yeah. interpretation. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. By contrast, Shem and Japheth showed respect for their father. Yes. Mm -hmm. Actually, I like the way they walked backwards into the room. Yeah. yeah. That really, that touched me. Yeah, they honored their father. The, some of the suggestions are that Ham had castrated Noah. That's one suggestion. That oh, Ham sure. slept with his stepmother, which was obviously forbidden. And even though the, the laws hadn't been brought in then, it still would not have been acceptable. But that this action would have brought about the curse um, because of it producing the offspring, which was Canaan. Or because you've got to bear in mind as well that they had uh, planted and grown the vineyard. It takes a long time yes. for a vineyard yeah. for to grow in, and produce grapes that will produce yeah. enough to get drunk. Yes. So it could have the option that it could have been Canaan in cohorts with Ham that orchestrated this. There's also the possibility that Ham or Canaan had attacked his father in a homosexual altercation with yeah. both of them. Mm -hmm. I suppose the equivalent of today would be like something like date rape using drugs, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's clear that something was done. I mean, it's uh, Ken there was an act of something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was something, an act of doing yep. something. Yes, because he says he knew what he had done. Mm. But Canaan was cursed as a result, uh, which uh, is the, the root of the conjecture that Canaan was the illegitimate offspring of an unholy and forbidden union. But he also could have been the perpetrator. Uh, mm. We also know that Canaan becomes idiomatic of Israel's enemies. Verse 26, he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem and Canaan shall be his servant. The word Japheth means entanglement and it's twofold and it's like a repetitious pun. Verse 28, and Noah lived after the flood 350 years and all the days of Noah were 950 years yes. and he died. Okay, so chapter 10, uh, chapter 10 records the table of nations. Uh, there's 70 70 names on it. So Jesus originally sent out 12 apostles. 12 disciples, yep. Apostles, uh -huh. disciples. Okay. Now they, they represent the 12 tribes, but remember that one was split into two separate ones and made to make 13, which uh -huh. was Ephraim and Manasseh, as was the disciple with Judah's replacement. There turned out to be 13 disciples. Because there was the original 12 and then there was uh, Matthias, Judas replacement. I just noticed that today. Um, I don't know what the relevance of it is, but I just thought it was interesting. But later on, then Jesus sent out 70, which seems to be representing the 70 nations. So we have 12 initial disciples that represent the tribes, one of them being split in the, by, in the 13, making 13, which is Ephraim and Manasseh. And then 70, which also would line up with the Table of Nations, the 70 nations. It's just an observation, and I don't know what significance it has, just aware that it's there. 
I'm not going to read the whole of Genesis 10 because it's full of unpronounceable names. You can read it at your leisure at home. Darts, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were sons born after the flood. So it lists the sons of Japheth. These represent, by those that have studied this out, okay, I haven't studied it out, but I believe them uh, because they all seem to agree fairly much. There's there's a few anomalies in it, but in essence, uh, I'll give you the bald <laughs> figures of it. Uh, Japheth uh, represents the nation, the those that would be southern Russia and northern Iran. The name Gomer means complete, and Magog would be the region of Gog and features heavily in the end times. Okay, so that would be. I, I'm just covering Genesis ten, really, really spartingly because there's lots out there if anybody is interested in the table of nations there's any amount of information out there and books on it verse six lists and the sons of ham now this is an extensive list uh and i think this is because of the the then this lineage emphasizes uh the enemies and represents the enemies uh to israel so Ham seems to represent Africa and Asia connection. Now it's interesting within that lineage, the name Foot or Put, whichever you P H U T in some translations and P U T in others. Putin. Putin, yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> um, but it actually means a bow. Oh. Isn't that interesting? Yes. So the lineage there also leads into Nimrod, which means a mighty hunter, but it also means we will rebel. Now, Nimrod was um, a, like a, a potentate, a terrorist. He was the first despot. He was an anarchist, activist. He was militant. He, he, was... he didn't walk with God. Well, that would be putting him mildly. <laughs> but he would have had a closer walk with Hitler. Um, he's also believed to have had or carried the name Marduk, which was the god of Babylon. Verse 10, we're going to read verse 10. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. So he was raising up a kingdom, which when we come to, the, uh, to looking at Nimrod, the end times is a kingdom being raised up under the one world order. Yeah. Babel was the place where the languages were confused. And that's where we get the term babbling from. But Babylon also actually means confusion, mixture or chaos. Well, Have you ever... Scripture where it says Babylon, the place where Satan dwells. Yes, there's. it's in Revelation and it's... Uh, a seat is in Pergamos. That throne was moved. There's actually quite a history to that throne at Pergamos, um, which is quite a, it's quite an interesting, because it, it got sent to, I think it was Germany, and they sent it back. <laughs> if I remember right, it's too long ago from we did that, but we would have covered it in our uh, end time study about three or four years ago. Produced the lineage that was Nimrod, obviously one of the most evil dictators ever known. But... Have you ever wondered why scripture tells us that we're not to mix certain materials? It seems like a very peculiar law. But when we look, we are instructed not to mix or blend in pagan practices or traditions with our worship of God as well. And there's many, many lessons in that as well. In there also, you'll find Nineveh. It says in verse 12, and resin between Nineveh and Kela, the same is a great city. Nineveh means abode of the god Ninus and is the capital of Assyria. Also, what gets a mention in here in verse 19 is Sodom and Gomorrah within this lineage. So we actually see a composition of uh, evil, a theme of evil and enemies of God running right through it. Verse 21 says, unto Shem also, and then it lists Shem's lineage of which we know that uh, Jesus Christ comes down through through that lineage. Um, so we did actually manage to get 
chapter nine and chapter 10 finished. What about that? We did. That's called Miracles. 